This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Roy Goldman was the creator of Daisy Dot, a typesetting program for the Atari 8-Bit computers, which he published from about 1987 to 1990. There were three versions of Daisy Dot, the original plus Daisy Dot 2 and Daisy Dot 3. The earliest version was freeware, and later versions asked for payment for access to special features. This interview took place on May 11, 2019. After we talked, Roy sent me scans of some memorabilia from that time. See the show notes at ataripodcast.com to see those. Start from the beginning. So I was born in Denver, Colorado uh, in 1972. Um, And I was remember being first interested in calculators. My dad uh, spent his whole career as a professor of uh, physics at the University of Denver uh, and was heavily involved in in using the computers of that era for his work. Um, and he uh, used a timeshare cray uh, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. He was a professor at the University of Denver. Um, and so he was eager to keep me excited in, in math and science and I remember I took like a calculator class when I was six or seven and got excited about that. <laughs> nice. And then I remember at, at the at the University of Denver there was a college there was a course for kids to introduce them to, to computers, and it was a TRS eighty Model Three I think was the first computer I started working with. Um, so I got excited about uh, computers for sure, and I remember almost begging my my parents to get me ones and. Um, you know, we were, I think this was an era where the late seventies, early eighties, uh, the Apple II was there. The Apple II was, was certainly more on the expensive side, uh, and got my eyes on the Atari 400. And I, I remember, I think I was eight, maybe nine. I got, uh, my first Atari 400, the 16 K model, uh, and just was so excited about that thing. So I spent a ton of time. You know, initially just playing games with it, had the cassette recorder, um, and and then eventually started you know typing in programs that came along with it, and uh, just really getting uh, quite obsessed, I would say, with with computers and programming. Um, and it was about sort of eight or nine years old, and and sort of went from there. I definitely remember about that age going to visit my dad at work, and he was showing me how they use punch cards for the cray. And I was thinking, well, this is silly because I, I can I can I can program much faster on my Atari. My Atari is way faster than your Cray. <laughs> uh, just going through the whole uh, punch card experience. So that was that was sort of the the get go of it. The Cray people didn't have to deal with that 400 keyboard though. So <laughs> well, yeah, that keyboard was amazing. Yeah, I remember buying one of the. Uh, at some point, people were buying these separate add on keyboards to try to add some real strokes to it. Uh, those those were pretty miserable. Right. But uh, yeah, that that was how I got started. Nice. So I couldn't find any other software by you other than uh, the the three versions of of Daisy Dot. But Daisy Dot, I mean, is a beautiful fleshed out program written in assembly language. So how did you get from kid playing games to accomplished assembly language programmer? Well, actually, the so Daisy Dot actually evolved across the three different versions. um, but actually, the very first thing I wrote was a program called the Compactor Detector. And so if you – I just did it this morning. I Googled it, and th- there's even some screenshots of it up still on all these amazing archive sites. Um, but it was the first thing I wrote um, in BASIC, and it was there at a time when there were a few different tools out there that could compress uh, files. They had funny names like Scrunch and Squish, and I forget all of them. Right, right. Uh, but if you lost track of the file extension, you had pretty much no clue what the file was. And so I remember the very first tool I wrote and put out there on different bulletin boards was called the Compactor Detector, and it would just look at the first few bytes of these different files and make a good guess about what tool was used. Um, so that was the first thing I wrote. Um, you know, the the story for behind Daisy Dot really was. One of, you know, just for some context, I was, this was middle school. Um, I was maybe 11 or 12 years old 
uh, I think it was 12 or 13. And, um, you know, I'd already been using my Atari quite a bit. Um, and in middle school, a couple kids had gotten the, the original Macintosh. Um, and this was still an era where, you know, the laser printer was just way too expensive. So no one had a laser printer. Um, but I remember my friend had their Mac, um, and obviously it was a beautiful experience, but when we would work on class reports, you know, they would submit these amazing looking documents relative to whatever I could get out of my Epson printer. So, you know, already it was in, they, the Mac was putting the printer in graphics mode. So you had nice big proportional fonts and, and integrated images. Um, and you know, I was submitting the standard Epson dot matrix output where if you, you know, if you wanted to look better, you made it bold, but it was always that single ugly font, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the G never looked right. Um, and I just sort of got hooked on that whole idea of, you know, how, how can I do better here? Um, especially once I figured out that the printer that my, the Mac printer was about the same as the Epson printer. It was just in graphics mode instead of text mode. Um, so I remember writing some very simple code in basic, um, that would take some text and use some hard coded fonts and, um, essentially render that text in graphics mode. And this was a time when I think analog and antic were still quite popular. And, and that was a time where you'd submit your code and hope that they, they, they printed, you know, an article about your, your program and included the code. Mm -hmm. And so the very first thing I attempted with Daisy dot was to send in that basic code, you know, it was quite short. I think I sent it to antic to analog and I was disappointed because they, you know, they never published, um, you know, the code that way. And so then I thought, okay, why don't I just do this myself? So, and, and try to publish it myself. So the very first version of Daisy Dot was written in uh, Basic. It was, I think, it was called Turbo Basic at the time, where you could compile it to get some extra speed out of it. Sure, Turbo Basic XL. That's like yeah. So great that's what the original Daisy version. Dot was was written in. Um, and Daisy Dot Two. By the time I got to that, and we can talk about what what went to each version. That was written mm -hmm. in C using what was called a light speed C compiler, um, which I got my hands of. And now I didn't really know C. So I was like, just sort of futzing my way through that. Um, and at the same time, trying to learn C, uh, and getting some books on it. Uh, I remember even taking a C class at the local college when I was, oh man, was this maybe 15 or 16 to try to get better at that. Um, and then even Daisy dot three was mostly written in C. Um, you mentioned assembly. There were a couple things I wrote in assembly, just, they were just too slow. I couldn't figure out how to get the compiler to get them to go fast enough, mm -hmm. but I was far from an assembly expert. Um, uh, you know, it was very, very targeted bits that were written in assembly. It was almost all, uh, C. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the, the different versions of, if you see what you what you remember, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, for the, all the versions, I believe were free, and then some of them you people could pay in order to get the manual, or I think get a couple of extra features. So I mean, this was mostly a freeware product. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was generally free. I think that you know the for Daisy Dot Three, which was the one that was the most popular, um, and maybe I was more mature by then. I was in. Um, this was finished when I was in my senior year of high school. Um, I, I made the, the free version actually be crippleware to some extent. That was the mm -hmm. common thing. So, uh, the crippleware version was the, the entire program, but you could only use one font at a time. And I, I don't remember how I settled on this as the thing to differentiate it. Um, but you know, I, I said that if you want the full version where you could mix fonts, uh, that would be $25. Um, and so that's, um, where I got the, I'd say the, the bulk of, um, the users and, and customers and, you know, I mean, jumping ahead a little bit to that, it, it was just an incredibly fun experience. I was just rummaging through my stuff because my parents are really good about keeping the stuff, but I still have boxes with, you know, hundreds of letters of people, um, ordering the software um, sending me examples of how they use the software, wow. um, you know, for everything from wedding invitations to programs for their, for their churches to crossword puzzles. Um, and this, this was largely my life for <laughs> almost the entirety of high school. 
Um, And the thing that really made the difference was getting some of these, um, getting reviews in some of the magazines at the time. So, you know, I think it was the original Daisy that got covered by Computer Shopper, if you remember that magazine. And I I dug up my copy of it. Um, He was 1987. He was a guy named Jeff Brenner ran the column called Applying the Atari. It was like one page in Computer Shopper. Um, and he gave me that first plug and, and it sort of took off from there. Um, and Daisy dot two got, um, a really strong review in, in Antic. Um, and yes, it was shareware, but you know, there was always this option of send, send me, uh, you know, a, a check in, in the mail and I'll send it to you. And it was, I think $10 for Daisy dot two. And by the time Daisy dot three, it was $25. Um, but it, it was, it was stunning to me how much how much response I got, you know, with essentially zero marketing and just a few uh, magazine articles, um, well-placed and, and good, good word of mouth. Hmm, nice. And what, which uh, issue of computer shopper did you say that was? Oh, hold on. Let me, let me get it one second. Okay. This is May, 1987. <laughs> May uh, that one. I don't think that one's been scanned yet. Um, okay, um, I was going to try to find the article, but I don't. Yeah, see I it. could. I could send you a copy later if you want. Yeah, that'd be the cover, great. The cover of that episode is talking about the low cost Amiga five hundred. Ooh, that and, sounds promising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, let's. So did it sounds like you might have made some serious money from this product, which might have been pretty darn gratifying for a high school kid. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was very fortunate in the you know the sense that my parents were very supportive of the whole thing, so that they let me keep all the revenue and they covered all the expenses. Um, wow! So, you know, I I got a few thousand dollars at the end of it all. Um, you know, and maybe five five thousand bucks, um, which you know when you're in high school, it's pretty pretty awesome. Right. Um, and you know, we had some expenses, but those were mostly. <laughs> Honestly, it was labor. You know, this was a time of we were we were sending out discs, and so there was a fair amount of labor to make um, copies of the discs. Um, and my mom was was head of operations, and so I trained her on how to make copies of the disc. <laughs> um, I did a lot of it. She did a lot of it. Um, and so we we have just piles of these discs around that we would ship out. We went to the local print shop and, and put out printed manuals. Mm-hmm. I know now all these manuals are online, but we put a lot of effort into making the the printed manual quite a nice experience. So I've got some of those hanging around, which is fun to keep looking through. So yeah, you get a package with the discs, the printed manual, and we, we pay for shipping as part of that. Um, had, had customers around the world too. Um, and then, you know, Daisy Dot 3 finished, I finished that as I was graduating from high school. Um, so I went off to college um, at Berkeley. And so through that summer, we shipped a bunch of them. But then my mom continued to help through that, about the first year while I was still in Berkeley, we were still getting orders. So she was sort of running the operation while I was still in, in college. And I remember, I think it was the review of Daisy Dot 3, it was in Start Magazine. There was a little section for Antic. Um, and I'd given them a heads up. It was just really so like homey. The last paragraph says something like Roy's in college now, but you know, his family will still fulfill these orders, which was, uh, <laughs> true, but you know, seeing it straight out there, that's, that's how it worked. Wow. Um, wow. So this whole thing, I mean, I believe you published this from about 87 through 1990, pretty late in the life of the Atari 8-bit computer. Yep. And yet, People were still in. I mean, the ST was out by then, of course, the Mac and all that, but people were still sure, yeah. into this. I mean, I think I remember thinking that if I had just figured this, if I had figured this out or been a little older and done this a couple of years earlier, um, it could have been even more fulfilling. But, you know, honestly, it was great. Um, you know, the money was nice, but this really did set me up in many ways for my future career. I, you know, I'm sure it helped me get into college. Um, it helped me win different awards. It helped me get a um, scholarship um, while I was in college. To um, you know, it was, a, it was a really cool scholarship that Microsoft put out. I forget the number, but they they I won the scholarship, and Microsoft paid for I think a year of my college, 
and I got an internship up there. Um, and I was doing well in school, but you know, whenever I had to write about a project or an essay, I just, you know, it, it was my go-to things to write about. Um, and you know, when you're always looking for something to, to set yourself apart, uh, from just, you know, doing okay in school, this was always a, a great project to rely on. Um, and really set me up for my entire career because I, you know, I, I didn't even know any better, but I was doing all, all the different functions that go into running a software company. I was, I was the designer, I was the product manager, I was the engineer, I was QA, I was operations, I was marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, that's really set the course for my entire career in software where I've, I've done a, a variety of all those things. So are you still in software today? I am. I am. I, uh, you know, I, I studied computer science at, at Berkeley. I, I went and did uh, a PhD in computer science at Stanford. Um, and you know, I didn't work much as a professional software engineer. Um, maybe that was sort of one thing is I, I have to say I was a little burnt out from writing all that code. Um, and, and the reality is, you know, in a modern age, being a professional software engineer requires a, a ton of discipline beyond what I was doing at the time. Um, so I think I have a good solid understanding and appreciation, but, you know, mostly I've been managing software engineering teams for the last, um, I'd say 10 years or so. And so I had a, a, a great time. I worked at, um, Tesla motors for four and a half years, if you're familiar with, with their cars. So I was leading yes, of course. Software team for the, the in-car display on the model S I, I was there for the very beginning of that. Uh, project all the way through launching to tens of thousands of cars. And so that was probably the, the most exciting thing I've worked on in my professional career is to be responsible for the software on that big touchscreen in the Model S and all the, the mobile apps and all the cloud infrastructure that connects the cars um, and great memories of, of working with and stories of working with Elon Musk. And then and then about four years ago, I, I left Tesla to join a, a 3D printing company called Carbon, um, headquartered in, in Redwood City in the Bay Area, uh, leading the software team there. And that's been really exciting and fun. Um, you know, certainly I've done a lot of working on software as it relates to bridging the physical world with the virtual world. So, you know, working on maybe it, was in, maybe it all comes from the fact that I like working with printers at the time, but I, I really get excited about you know, software as it relates to the physical world and, um, and 3d printing. We, we talk a lot about it as being sort of the, the 3d version of, of some of what we were doing back in the day and 2d. So, um, you know, I've always, I think been excited about that side of things. Cool. Yeah. You move from 2d printing to 3d printing mm -hmm. and also you move from uh, Atari computers to a, a working on a car that you, on which you can play Atari games on the giant touchscreen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> come, for, come full circle. Right. Um, all right, so we talked about Compactor Detector and we talked about Daisy Dot. Did you do any other software that either published or unpublished for the Atari? Oh, geez, I don't, I don't think so. You know, by the time Daisy Dot was in swing, you know, that, that was really all my effort going into that. Um, you know, it was, as you may know, by, by the end, it was, all, it was a group of different programs, too, because it was not just the system to, to print, print out the files, but it was a graphical editor for creating new fonts and several other accessories. So uh, that, that was pretty much all, all my time was, was spent on that. Sure. In the Atari world, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said your parents still have uh, uh, all the, the, the stuff stored away in the attic or whatever. So my next two questions are, uh, did you, you still have the source code to the stuff and do you still have your Atari? You know, I, I, I looked around for the source code and I couldn't quite find it just yet. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a big stack of that paper somewhere. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've got some discs, five and a quarter discs with it. You know, I'm kicking myself a little bit for not having tried to do a better job of saving that at the time. Um, so I, I have it somewhere, I think. Uh, but that part of it is a little bit mysterious. Um, I certainly do have my 130XE. Um, I still have that. That's that's where I migrated toward by the end when I was doing real development. It was pre-decked out as far as you could at the time. Um, I think, gosh, what you can add some memory to it. Mm -hmm. Who knows how many disk drives I had hanging off of that thing? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, gosh, I think my it was like the there was an Indus 
drive. If you ever remember that thing? That was the best drive I ever got. Sure. Um, and it was amazing, but it was like falling apart. <laughs> I had to take the case off, and I had to manually move the the, the head around to get it to work. <laughs> um, but that was my go-to. That was my go-to drive. Um, but the 130 XC, it was, it was a great machine. I mean, I'm sure you you've heard this a lot, but the Tart is just a fan, fantastic machine. Um, just the the design was so elegant. The software was so straightforward and so powerful for what it could do. And you know, I think all our we always had a bit of a chip on our shoulder of like when people were, when seeing the Apple II take off and and always excited about you know this this Atari machine is superior. Why why can't we get this to take off? And uh, it was always sort of that that mentality. But mm-hmm. it was it was it was a great machine. It was a great way to learn computers. You know, I've got I've got teenage kids now, and and you know they're interested to some extent in. In some of this stuff, but it, everything is learned at such a high level too, and so I, you know, I think there's a real advantage of of learning learning this stuff on much simpler machines and and getting a better understanding of how the machines actually work. It's really hard today when you're just starting out, and and obviously the computers are so powerful and so complex, and the operating systems are so complex. It, it's really detached from how these things actually work, and so I feel like um, maybe this is just the the old guy speaking up. <laughs> You know, there's there's a real advantage to having been there in the earlier days, and and even now still at work. You know, I feel like some of the colleagues that are in their my colleagues in the 40s, we, we all have a little bit of that advantage, and it, you know, it's it's very easy to go, even as the way we think about problems go up and down the stack. Where I think some of the the younger engineers, even if they're just excellent programmers, are just just more decoupled from from how the computers actually work, and uh, and and you know, you can get yourself in weird corners sometimes when you're not, not as familiar with how, how things work under the hood. Yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> um, cool. So in addition to programming, did you, did you use Daisy Dot for your own school papers and that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I used it for every single thing that I did in school. Um, I, uh, and I was just as I was rummaging through things, I was finding reports and projects. And um, yeah, it was... It was a big part of everything I was doing, not only coding it, but to your point of using it and and you know just seeing how other people was using it was also just just amazing to me. Like when people would send me literally wedding invitations or <laughs> things that they're using for their church programs, and you know, and and there's a there's a whole world of people creating and publishing manuals on how to use Daisy Dot, which was just so exciting. Uh, there's a I found this, but it's also online. There's a guy named David Richardson in Kansas who was publishing really in-depth manuals on how to make the most out of Daisy Dot. And he designed a lot of the fonts too. That was the other great thing is like, you know, some of the fonts were pretty artistic. I was never the most artistic person. And so that it was great to have people out there just for fun designing the fonts and sending them to me and being excited that I would include them. Um, and, you know, getting a whole community around font design and 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 you know that people designing fonts that were really just ways to encode images right so someone mm-hmm. i think it was david figured out a whole system for making crossword puzzles with daisy dot um where you'd essentially create fonts that correspond to the different cells of the crossword puzzle and i'm like look at this like how, how on earth did you make this work um and so it was really exciting to see people just not only using it as a productivity tool, but as a, as a tool to be creative and for coming up with, with things for their own lives. So it was, it was really way beyond, I think, what I was ever imagining when I got started on it. Hmm. Nice. So what, what haven't I asked you about that time that I should have? Oh, what, what should you have asked? Yeah, what should I have asked? Well, I mean, I, I certainly have some some funny stories that you know, that might people might appreciate. Um, you know, one story was someone at some point, and I never got their real name. Um, you know, after the original Daisy Dot created a clone of the of the project product and improved it, um, and sent me, you know, a, a whole lot, a lot of information about it, but never put their name in it, and I, I have it with me. They called themselves the Wiz, and it said, "Thanks for a great idea." And he called it Daisy Dot Two. And I remember it was he called himself the Cryptic Wizard. 
And I remember being like pretty offended. It's like, okay, you know, I, you don't use the same name, you know, and it was just a pretty blatant ripoff of the name. Um, and, you know, it had certainly added some pretty impressive improvements, but I remember like, you know, and I, I, I can't remember the exact story, but I think I sent him a note saying, you know, you really shouldn't use that name. And I think I claimed I had copyright for it, but I don't know if I did. Um, and I think he, he renamed it to maybe dot magic or something like that. So I, I can't quite remember the entire story, but there was definitely some drama there of, huh. of someone co-opting the name and, and, but not naming themselves. Um, so, you know, that, that was, <laughs> I think a pretty entertaining, uh, story. <laughs> the whole thing. It's pretty uh, hard. Yeah. And, you know, I think maybe another interesting story. I was, a. Uh, you know, my, my family's originally from Israel, um, and so I used to visit Israel a fair amount, and um, I got, when I was there, somehow got introduced to someone who was affiliated with uh, the news, newspaper industry there, and there was a, a magazine that got put out, uh, I don't know, at rate, maybe every month or every quarter, aimed at teens, and so I have a copy here where they did a story on, on me as sort of, here's a a teenager in America writing software. So it was pretty exciting to be featured in a, in an Israeli magazine highlighting, you know, teen achievements. And so, you know, really funny things, especially funny to show those things now to my own kids. And they're, you know, when I'm the same age that I was at at the time. So, um, maybe, maybe very, very minor celebrity in my own uh, nerdy world there. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Any other stories come to mind? Uh, no, there, there are some really neat stories. I, you know, I, I, I built some pretty strong relationships with some customers. Um, you know, there was, there was a customer in particular, I remember his name was John Dvorak. Um, and he was, you know, in his seventies when he got Daisy Dot Mm -hmm. and, and he, he was so excited about it all, but he, you know, he was, he struggled with the basic stuff and, you know, this was an era where, you know, I wanted to help a customer succeed. So, you know, he would, he would call me and say, Hey, can I get some help with this? And it's like, sure, I'll help you with this. And, you know, it got to the point where, you know, he became a pretty close friend and, and would call me not only for help, but call to check in and end up staying in touch with him for years afterwards. You know, he got older and, you know, I think his family knew that, he, you know, that I was a part of his life and, you know, I think he passed, he, you know, he was, this was already, he was already an older guy. Um, but you know, it was a fun thing and he would get to know my mom. He would call my mom, say, how's Roy doing? Um, and you know, here, and I think he was living in Downers Grove, Illinois. Um, and you know, I think his kids were older than I was. Um, but you know, just, just, I guess so surprising kinds of things coming out of, building relationships with, um, with individuals in that way was, was pretty wild. And, you know, I had lots of pen pals. He was sort of the only person where I really had, you know, this like verbal or phone relationship, but I had lots of pen pals of people around the world syncing up with me, um, showing me what they're working on, asking about new things, seeing how I could collaborate. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's part of it. You know, I think it was also stunning. I think just how much time I spent on this. Um, I, uh, I joke, you know, I didn't have much of a social life in high school, but I wasn't too. I didn't have much of a problem with it. But I would just spend just days straight working on this stuff, and 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 time would just fly. And I just have these memories of, you know, Saturday morning would, you know, I'd wake up and the computer was right next to my bed, and I would just just be programming literally the entire day. And, you know, my, my, my parents would try to get me to come outside, but it was mostly like, I'm just here busy. And it just never felt like, you know, work. It was just fun. Um, and just the amount of sheer time I spent, um, was pretty wild. Um, and it's really fun for me now. I just even discovered there's another site where someone consolidated, all the Daisy Dot software and put up screenshots from all these things. And so it's just, just wild for me to see years of my life, put, mm. you know, put up on display digitally. 
uh, is pretty pretty awesome to see any level of interest and community around that today uh, is just pretty fun. Which brings me to my my next question, which is if if you could send a message to the Atari community that still exists, that people are still playing with these machines, uh, and you you can send them a message right now, what would it be? Well, I'm just super (laughs) excited and thrilled that people are out there still getting some pleasure and satisfaction from these machines. And, you know, I have to say it's a little hard for me to relate um, because computers have come so far along you know, the, the fact that, and I realize now there's, there are people actually still using Daisy Dot, and I almost want to ask, like, why? But, you know, I think the fact that there's an appreciation and excitement for, for the machines and, and the software that was built at the time, um, you know, I'm just super thankful and excited. And, you know, the fact that people are putting this stuff together for me is, is great to be able to revisit these great memories and to have them all digitally in, in one place and, and just, to see all the infrastructure that's put in place that people can still run the software and people actually use the software, it's a, it's a little overwhelming, to be honest. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm thrilled about it. And, and, and you know, I, I can't say I, I would want to go back and keep using Daisy Dot. So, you know, but, <laughs> but I, I'm really excited that people uh, are even interested in this stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I think it's just fantastic. So I'll just say thanks. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks.